Welcome to another episode of Le Coin des Espères. Today I'm here with Lisa McDonald. Lisa is a clinical naturopath, academic lecturer, and practitioner board member of the Australian Register of Naturopath and Herbalists in Australia. After a personal experience with chronic inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS, mold illness, Lisa became passionate about knowing all there is to know about SIRS and mold illness and all the confounding health issues that tend to come with patients who experience SIRS and chronic illness. She's one of the few naturopaths in Australia who has studied with Dr. Schumacher and has developed a unique process of analysis of patients' health to capture, track and treat multi-system illnesses like SIRS. Lisa brings together her knowledge of nutrigenomics, psychology, functional medicine, Dr. Schumacher's and other SIRS thought leaders into her own integrated, unique and integrated naturopathic systems-based framework to provide individualized treatment. You can find more details about what Lisa and her upcoming projects on her website. So in this interview, we'll talk about Lisa's own journey with molds, what mold toxicity is and how common it is, symptoms of mold toxicity, causes and triggers, consequences on various body systems and of course digestion, pathology and testing, treatment approaches, diet and finally Lisa's final thoughts to take home. As a reminder, everything that is discussed in, in this interview does not intend to diagnose or treat a medical condition, so please ask your practitioner before implementing any new treatment. Well, good morning, good afternoon, bonjour, bonsoir, et bienvenue. Uh, today, I'm so pleased to have with us Lisa McDonald. Lisa, who is a mold expert in Australia. Thank you, Lisa, for being with us today. Oh, it's so lovely to be here. Thank you. And um, so, it's going to be about mold today. Um, and would you like to share, just to start off, a little bit of your personal story with mold or what uh, brought your interest into mold? Um, look, I, I guess um, what brought me to mould was um, not by choice, um, but, but because it happened to me. So um, probably would be a, just over a decade now, um, we uh, experienced mould in our home. But actually, before we even paid attention to that, we actually had um, a son who was very, very sick and had severe eczema and um, developed what now in hindsight we would probably call mast cell activation um, and syndrome and, um, and through that process of trying to work out what, how to, um, heal him and help him. Um, that's where we, where I came to discover Dr. Schumacher's work with, uh, mold and chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Um, and so it was part of that process, uh, that, um, discovered him. But then of course, because you get so focused on your children, you don't realize that you're, you're not good as well. So. I actually realized that all the symptoms that I was suffering from was SIRS as well. Um, and so I guess we went through the whole process that affected different members of our family in different ways. Um, and we ended up, uh, to cut a long story short, uh, we ended up having to sell um, our house and everything inside our house pretty much um, we had to get rid of. Um, however, because this was such a long time ago, we didn't realize that there was um, there are some things which a lot of people still make this mistake that can be in your uh, home that are still contaminated and you bring into an, a, another dwelling. And so went through it again in uh, my own clinic um, where I had taken all my contaminated books to, which I didn't realize were contaminated. Wow. Uh, and so I've sort of been through the process a couple of times. Um, and uh, so I've come to where we are now, which is in a safe environment and, um, and you know, uh, what we might even get to at some stage uh, in this discussion or another one, but you know, it is something that is uh, something I always need to be aware of is, is to avoid exposure to mold because I never ever want to be brainless like that again. Wow, that there must have been a, a, a terrible experience for the whole family, and uh, which has lasted quite a long time, right? For you, for the whole family. So, um, okay, so let tell us, um, Lisa, what is mold toxicity? Um, well, mold toxicity, I guess, is a generalized term um, in in that it gets used in different contexts for different things. But really, um, mold il illnesses really like biotoxin or, um, or sorry, mold toxicity is more like uh, mold or biotoxin illness. Um, and then that's also a general term to really describe what we, um, what is termed chronic inflammatory response syndrome. 
Um, there are other things that you can uh, that can happen to you when you're exposed to mold. Um, and well, I guess I can broadly speaking, there's three key things, I suppose. Um, one is that people can have allergies. Um, and two, people can be, um, I guess, um, colonized. And then the third thing is what's called this chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is that toxicity, that mold or biotoxin illness. So there's a lot of interchange of terms out there um, in the uh, yeah, on the internet, I guess, or out there. But really what, uh, uh, what I'm talking about here is chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So it's not allergy. It's yeah. actually the innate immune system's response. And so it would be the, uh, the latest stadium, the latest phase of uh, uh, mold uh, toxicity, right? So we can start with allergies and uh, uh, light symptoms and then go more into colonization and then finally, finally like uh, toxicity, heavy toxicity. Well, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. It's actually not quite like that, actually. Some people in the family can, um, it's not a progressive thing like that. Some people can. Um, have chronic inflammatory response syndrome because that's part of the innate immune system. Um, but allergy is actually part of the adaptive immune system. And um, often what happens, people can be in a, in a moldy environment um, and they can feel and they know they're having some sort of health problems because of it. And they'll go to their doctor and their doctor will go, oh, well, let's test for allergies and they'll test for mold allergies and nothing comes back. And so they're told, oh, well, it must be something else. We don't know. Um, but, you know, it's not an allergy. And so often that's what happens is people get, get they are having these responses to it and, and it's not being picked up by conventional medicine. Um, so you can so you can have chronic inflammatory response to mold um, and allergy, um, but they're two separate things. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that people can also get from being exposed to mold, generally speaking, is that they can get something like aspergillosis, for example, which is when it's um, when it actually gets into the lungs, which is a totally another um, thing again. So I guess broadly speaking, there's three key major things that may happen to people. But I guess today I wanted to talk more about chronic inflammatory response syndrome because that's the kind of thing that doesn't get picked up often by conventional medicine. Yeah, sure. And how common uh, it is to have SIRS? How common is it? Um, I guess. Uh, we don't exactly know because it's a relatively, it's it's still establishing in terms of um, a condition in some countries. Some countries it's maybe a little bit more progressive than others. So if I was to use Australia as an example, um, there's an awareness of it, but in conventional medicine it's not officially recognised. Um, and different countries are in different um, stages of recognition. And because of that, we don't really have a really good um, uh, research but what we do know, uh, well, not we do, what we estimate is it's probably about 25% of the population. And that's just based on the um, how commonly the um, HLA-DQDR gene is in the, in, in the population. So it's a guesstimate at this stage. But I think that, and, and I mentioned that gene because that's from um, Dr. Schumacher's work that suggests that people with that particular gene and particular haplotypes are more susceptible to chronic inflammatory response to, to mold. Um, but, uh, but I think because we're getting so much more flooding and, um, and I guess, um, because it's not something that's recognized, there could be a lot more, a much, much higher percentage of people that have been affected because it's just not being picked up, but there's more people being exposed to the things that set it off. And that's a pretty high, uh, percentage of people just looking at the gene, right? So pretty high. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's... and exposure could be like even much more than that. So yeah, so that's be impressive. Yeah, and 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 interestingly too um, is that it, it it isn't discriminatory against any particular age group or background or anything. It can happen to anybody or any age group, um, and it's not particularly at this stage that we can see any particular location uh, or geographic location. However, of course, in the areas that are a bit more warm and humid, you're going to see more of it. Having said that, I've said I've got patients in Adelaide, which is a dry area in, in Australia. But, uh, but yeah, so it's it's not necessarily discriminatory to any specific group that we can see at this stage. Yeah, because it can also just be related to just a, a leaking a leakage, like in the house, in the garage, everywhere. Right? It could be like a leakage, not just floods. So yeah, yes, that's right. In a lot of houses, even here, 
I'm, uh, I'm in France, I'm living in France now, but there are some houses that are, you know, pretty moldy in Paris as well. So that it can be anywhere. In any That's right. And the other thing people don't realize too is that it's all the exposure can also be um, not just their homes, but their workplace and also their vehicles. So what their, their car can also be a problem as well. Um, I did want to note though too, the other, um, there are a few things that um, can trigger it, but I guess we won't get to that. It's not just mold. Mm. But we could talk about that in a minute. Yeah, yeah. And um, so when we talk about symptoms like mold toxicity, mycotoxins, so the symptoms can affect uh, every system, everybody's system, right? So there's a lot, lot of symptoms. Would you like to mention like the, you know, the main ones maybe? Yeah. So, so um, one of the key aspects of chronic inflammatory is that it's multi-system and multi-symptoms so any of the symptoms i might mention if you've only got one of them it's probably not going to be um, um a mold or a biotoxin illness it might be something else and a lot of the symptoms actually um can look like other things so it's really important to be able to, uh, to um, differentiate between what might be mold and something else but i guess the key things that are agreed across across um um groups that are into uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome and uh, Dr. Schumacher's work is that there's a cluster of symptoms and and there's a and that particular cluster of symptoms you need to have at least um, eight um, of those you need to have at least one sy- symptom in eight of those clusters right. um, but I but and and that can be you can have a look at that either on my website or on uh, Dr. Schumacher's website um, surviving mold but to sort of bring them together and sort of broadly speaking, it affects things like your um, respiratory system, of course, because that's mostly what people would recognize mold be associated with, but it's a lot more than that. So you've got shortness of breath. Um, you might have, um, you know, post-nasal drip. You might have a bit of sinus con- congestion. Um, one of the most marked things about chronic inflammatory response syndrome is actually the neurological assist, uh, assist symptoms. So you get brain fog. And you get difficulty concentrating and memory problems and confusion and dizziness. It's it's not pleasant. <laughs> um, I often, I sometimes uh, would say to my husband, oh, like I've got mold brain, you know, because you just, it's just horrible. It's It feels a little bit like um, either you're, you know, developing some form of dementia, um, you know, dementia or, you know, early menopause kind of thing. So <laughs> there's a lot of neurological symptoms. Um, of course, there's the most, the other most common one is fatigue. So that significant um, fatigue and this weakness and lack of energy, it affects um, the gut. So there's things like um, oscillating between either diary or constipation. Um, there's a change in appetite. So what it, one of the things it does is increase your leptin because that gets dysregulated. So often people just want to eat constantly, like there's this constant feeling of hunger. And then the other end of that, people might feel like they have no appetite um, and lose significant weight. Um, where else do we go? Um, joint pain, uh, muscle stiffness, a terrible thing, um, mood disturbances. So anxiety, um, I would call it mold rage. Um, you know, people get really irritable and big mood swings, terrible insomnia. Um, uh, yeah, there's to name a few. <laughs> Well, that's uh, that, that. They will affect almost every everybody system. And to be honest, I've seen a few. Um, I you know I see a lot of SIBO patients, and a few of those SIBO patients, you know, when they present with a lot of symptoms, uh, yes, I I tell myself, okay, this is not just SIBO. There's something much yeah. bigger. So straight away, I think about mold and also Lyme. So they are the two big. Uh, you know, elephants in the room, and we need to to think about those um, major conditions. So, yeah, so everything, everything. So, and what? Okay, so you said already that there's this uh, genetic predisposition with the genetics, um, and then of course being within within an environment which is uh, moldy or so floods, humidity. So these are the main causes, right? About you know. Be- having a mold um, exposure and becoming sensitive to molds, what are the main triggers and causes? Would you like to just introduce a bit that? Yeah, so I guess the uh, inflammatory spots can come from the mold mycotoxins. So, um, and it's also the mold 
uh, the mycotoxins, the fractals of mold and the hyphae. So if there's a couple of different elements of the mold that you can expose to. So so that includes if you try and clean mold and it, and it's dying off, breathing that in is also um, a biotop with part of the biotoxin exposure. Um, the other thing is is that with water damaged buildings, there's a, a whole soup of um, bacteria and um, acetamyces and things like that that come um, that uh, can also come in that toxic soup. Some of which we don't know what they are, but we just find that people who are exposed to water damaged buildings, it's not just the mold, it's other stuff that comes with it. Mold has friends. Wow. Um, the other one is, um, uh, you know, tick borne or stealth infections that can also trigger off chronic inflammatory spot syndrome. Um, uh, the other, and other things like blue green algae, um, contaminated reef fish, cichlateria, there's a few things like that that can also trigger off chronic inflammatory spot syndrome. Um, and often in practice, I see a combination of people who have got, uh, I don't have got mold exposure. And then I find that then because that impacts the immune system, um, then I think, you know, other infections start to come up so that, you know, whatever they may have, you know, been bitten by a tick, you know, 10 years ago. And then suddenly all these symptoms uh, that you might associate with some tick-borne diseases actually start coming to um, fruition as well. So, um so yeah, they're probably the core, the core ones that's triggered off. And then in combination of, like I said, you know, if you do have the genetic predisposition, but having said that, probably about 90, about another 5% of patients don't actually have that gene. So okay. it's, it's that gene isn't a diagnostic tool. It's just one of the things we've observed that happens or seems to be susceptibility. Um, so I'm not sure whether the Okay, could you hear? Yeah, I was a. It was a bit sketchy, but I think it's going to be okay. Yeah, that's okay. So you were saying, can you say it again? You you think that um, the you not know, having the genetic predisposition uh, can of course affect the um, the trigger of um, SIRS? That's what that's what you were saying. Or I was just saying that sometimes when people are when people are um, in 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 mouldy environment or, or or exposed to those um, biotoxins. That um, we that most patients will have that genetic susceptibility, but not all. So you can still get yeah, that even though you don't have that susceptibility. Yeah. Okay. 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 That's yeah. That's interesting to to know. Yeah. Absolutely. So basically, um, and do you test for the genetics or no? You don't really do the the genetics. Um, well, I think I think testing is is a whole is a whole thing in itself because I think the problem with the um, with the diagnosis of SIRS is that. Uh, the chronic inflammation from biotoxins is that it's there's no one test there's no one test that can say okay this person's got SIRS so a lot of it is about really good case taking it's about ruling other things out it's about understanding whether the person's been exposed or not um, and you can use a number of um, a number of tests so did you want me to talk about that yeah 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 the, definitely yeah um then maybe we can come back a little bit on digestion because you know I'm I'm pretty strong on uh, you know digestive issues. But yeah, let's uh, let let's tackle the the testing and um, uh, yeah, tell us what uh, what would be the if there are any testing that you would maybe rather uh, recommend or prefer uh, or uh, you know what would be your approach? What would be if you if you had to share a few just a few tips about testing? Uh, well, I think like I said, you know, uh, testing will use helpful as, as additional data to a really good case taking. So you really need to understand the person's history and, like I said, uh, whether they've been exposed. Um, and then you need to see whether they meet the Sydney criteria. So part of it, as I mentioned before, is you need to have at least one um, symptom and at least six to eight of the uh, symptom clusters. Um, and then you can use the um, biomarkers that Dr. Schumacher um, uh, recommends and and that's really based on the back of his his work. And they're not really necessarily tests for mold per se. They're actually markers of inflammation and the innate immune uh, response. Uh, so that's things like leptin, which is uh, um, usually elevated, um, uh, antidiuretic hormone, or in Australia we use copeptin because we can't test that here, um, vasointestinal peptide. So there's quite a number of markers, but you really have to be trained in it to really understand um, what the pattern is. Yes, actually. Yeah. Um, and the other thing too is then I also um, test for general things like to give me a good idea of the status of that person's health because some people are like, 
really, really absolutely debilitated. And some people have um, comorbidity, so they might have additional um, uh, health issues that come with it. So I also do your general, you know, full blood count, check their thyroid, liver function test, all those things because it's so multi-system, you know, we need to sort of see the status of where everything's at. Uh, so yeah, testing is a little bit problematic because we can't do a lot of it in Australia, for example, and that's quite different. And different than in France. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then let's say, and even in the US, um, where you can do all of these tests, they're very cost prohibiting. They're thousands and thousands of dollars. So again, it comes back to a good clinical case, um, case review is really probably the key. Uh, you your listeners may also come across other tests like um, uh, mycotoxin, urinary mycotoxin yeah, tests, yeah, yeah. also uh, organic acids tests. Um, so both those tests are not necessarily, again, a test for mold per se. Um, the mycotoxin tests are really just picking up uh, metabolites of exposure to mycotoxins. So um, the, chal- the only challenge with the results of that test is that um, often people who have got says aren't necessarily great at metabolizing um, the mycotoxins and it may not appear in their urine and sometimes you actually find when you start detoxifying them their their results will look worse because <laughs> all of a sudden all these mycotoxins I mean, aren't yeah 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 so so you know th- there are some challenges with testing and i think that's you know where experience and good case taking etc is really important and uh, lisa what do you think about the uh, vcs uh, test you know the visual contrast Test. Have you heard of this test? Yeah. So the visual contrast sensitivity test is um, I, I I do use, and um, really because that helps us to understand um, what the because neuroinflammation is one of the features of um, chronic inflammatory response syndrome as well. And so the visual contrast sensitivity test is helping us to understand to what extent there is some neural inflammation going on there, uh, and it's really a test of to see whether you can see contrast. Um, and you know that that so if you do that test and there's certain columns of that test if you fail that that would suggest that perhaps mold might be part of the problem and or it can suggest that stealth infection is part of the problem which is a controversial statement but um but you know what you're looking at there is potentially neuroinflammation so yeah i do use that yeah okay that's good because it's a a much cheaper test to uh, you know uh, available so i think it's a uh, possibly a good thing to start with, you know, to to have a an idea of where the person is at, especially you know from a neurological point of view. And um, okay, so uh, treatment is very complex. Of course, you need to be trained in molds. Uh, it's something that you know you don't want to uh, treat you know, unless you're really trained. But um, very often, you know, in the SIBO uh, community, even Dr. Sieberger, uh, she says, you oh, know. If somebody has, you know, someone has molds or Lyme, especially molds, uh, you better want to treat first molds and then you uh, tackle SIBO. What is your uh, take on that? Um, look, I think that the most important thing is that the person needs to get away from mold. So, um, so irrespective of their SIBO status, they need to actually get away from the mold. So in controlling their environment is probably number one um, and biotoxin avoidance. And then number two, I actually, it kind of leans into SIBO because I feel like probably I remember noticing a few years into treating people with mold um, before SIBO was a big thing really was that um, I noticed, oh, that's really interesting. They all seem to have SIBO. So it's a very common thing, like probably about 95% of my patients would have SIBO really. Um, uh, so it, it is, and, and that's really because of what mycotoxin does to the lining of the gut. And, and how it also affects the bile. So um, because that's where your body tends to detoxify mycotoxins. So actually one of my first things after they've been out of the mold, so they need to be away from the exposure, is actually supporting things that you would probably do a little bit in SIBO, which is pre- helping produce bile. So you're wanting to increase their bile production, taurine, pancreatic enzymes, all those sorts of things, which is really important with SIBO. Um, and um, so, yes, so the gut and producing bile is probably one of the first things I, I do. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of, yeah, so it's kind of, and, and I and I love the view that unless you can get that sort of system going, um, then you actually run the risk of 
um, everything just recirculating. So you're at the risk of the mycotoxin going round, 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 round. Yeah. So the gut's really important to work on. Um, having said that, then you've also got the problem that the mycotoxins are contributing to SIBO. So bile, bile support is probably, you know, thin bread rule. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, what else can you tell us about the treatments? Yeah. So, so, uh, so I guess next to doing supporting bile production, the other thing too is to also make sure that um, the person, you know, most people have got a lot of symptoms that they're having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And most people I don't start on a binder first. So you'll probably see a lot of discussion around use of binders in, uh, in the mold toxicity or mold illness um, information. Um, I really don't do binders unless I know that person is in, is able to deal with that and, and, and also that their body is actually producing enough bile to do it because it depends on your body to actually produce bile and to be able to get that mycotoxin into the gut for it to actually then be able to, to be bound. And then also the pharmaceutical binders such as cholestyramine, for example, are actually bile sequestrants. So they're actually they're actually binding to the bile to help get that um, mycotoxin out. So like I said before, gut stuff really important, Tori, um, pancreatic enzymes, for example. Then the other thing is, is that often people are really debilitated and they've had long-term illness because by the time they've come to me they've been to everybody first and and or they've, or they've been to their doctor and a whole of the specialists and no one knows why they're sick and so a lot of it can also be around ATP support so mitochondria support to lift that energy lift the brain function because people need to be able to cope with life um and then you know of course detoxification support um re uh, supporting um regulating uh, or I guess modulating the immune system because the other thing too is that often people have a histamine problem um, because that sort of comes with the territory um, and also reducing inflammation that's really important so um, and the other thing of course is also then dealing with some of the confounding either viral load um, pathogen load um, you know fungal load so it's also to start moving those things on and then you sort of, and of course the binders. The other thing that I think is really important is also support for the autonomic nervous system. So, uh, so mental health support is really important, but calming that nervous system down because it's very heightened, um, and especially after they've been, it's almost, it, it, it's almost actually being in that environment and that whole process is almost a trauma in itself. And so, you know, dealing with any trauma or um, anything that's sort of. Um, being in fight flight you know mode it, calming that down also makes a big difference as well that's, that's probably the, yeah that's <laughs> really good. thank you lisa do you find any uh particular techniques to reduce and uh, you know nervous system uh, stress and trauma do you like something like you know gupta program or anything that you uh, you may have liked yeah so initially um you know Many, many moons ago when I first started with this, I noticed that anyone who was working on any psychosocial um, uh, activities that resonated with them, um, tend to those patients tended to, you know, do a lot better. And over the years, and of course, there's been different programs that have um, come around. Um, and to be honest, I have found most people have done well with the Gupta program. So I do think the Gupta program is great. There are some similar programs around, but that seems to be the one that's the most approachable for most people and doable because you've got to remember that most um, people who have got mold illness have got cognitive, uh, you know, the energy and cognition and memory and concentration. So if you have to try and do a program, I mean, you know, trying to zone in and concentrate on something is so hard. Um, so that program's probably been the best. There's other things too, um, that other people might resonate with so you know um, even like uh, emf tap you know tapping uh using tapping using havening techniques um some people uh, have actually um become a little bit more religious uh some people have found that helpful so yeah there's quite a number of um techniques that are that help people yeah that's great and um uh in terms of a uh, length of treatment, I guess it, it it takes what months and months, years. What 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 do you what do you normally see? Well, look, considering it's quite complex, and it's frequently July, September treatment, 
I'll be really honest, it's going to be at least six months. Um, and it, that doesn't mean six months of being in the same road that person's in, you know, and waiting six months before any kicks in. It's because it, oh, it's incremental changes over a period of time. And it depends on where the person's starting from. Um, you know, some people are completely bedridden. Um, other people, um, uh, it really affects their neural, uh, the neural space. So, um, you know, trying to sort of get their head around being able to do all the things that they need to do to make themselves better can be challenging. So yeah, at least six months. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's for sure. That's for sure. And, um, uh, do you find that these super sensitive, you know, people, patients, Initially, uh, how do they do with tolerating, you know, the some of the supplements? Do you find sometimes hard to to get into, you know, to start with some supplements, or how do you find it? Yeah, so out of brain there's cell activation um, syndrome is where that starting to kick in. So, so, um, so sometimes for some people, the mycotoxins and the and and the whole inflammatory response then starts to move to trigger the mast cells to become more activated, and that could be anything neurally or could be in their gut, etc. And as part of that, then they become more sensitive to things. Uh, so yes, the more sensitive patients. I actually, to be honest, I actually assume everybody's going to be sensitive when I first start <laughs> um, because uh, a lot of patients do develop that. So. I usually take things, uh, I usually do things either um, one thing at a time or a new treatment at a time. And or I find probably the most um, helpful thing when someone's in that space is is working with minerals actually, like the um, a lot of the trace minerals are actually really helpful because they can help with a lot of the detox pathways that need to be supported to help with um, mast cell activation. Um, interventions that might reduce in, uh, histamine is really important so maybe a low histamine diet maybe things like quercetin um, uh, some people uh, and then um, and then some people I might need to work with an integrated GP and get them on some mast cell stabilizers of pharmaceutical drugs um, to actually um, try to calm the mast cells down so we can do the work we need to do so it just depends on one of each okay so that, that makes sense yeah and uh, diet-wise, do you recommend anything in particular, or just the normal clean diet? Or is, is, is do you have like a you know, like a low mold, low moldy diet? I guess. No, well, it's a good question. I actually like you on the diet. It's actually quite individualized, but generally speaking, uh, um, most people will have a SIBO issue. Uh, issue. So usually, uh, they, they often have a histamine issue. They're often sensitive to gluten. So they're probably the three things that are probably the most common things. They might need to have low to be uh, SIBO, you know, com- low, uh, no gluten combination. Um, but then you'll have other the, other things like some people might have a real, uh, have an oxalate problem because one of the issues that happen with some, for some people is that um, the exposure to the aspergillus, aspergillus, sorry, which is one of the most common molds, and they might be um, colonized, etc. But they may have then problem um, breaking down the oxalates that that exposes them to, and so some people can't deal with oxalates. So you also need to consider they need to be on a low oxalate diet. Uh, uh, so so it's variable depending on the person that's sitting in front of me, to be honest. But they're probably the key things that I kind of look out for. It does mean that it potentially is a quite a restricted diet. Uh, so we also have to be careful to make sure that there's enough protein and that they're having, um, you know, protein and veggies and they're having things that are actually going to help them um, with some of their nutrients as well. So, yeah, it's quite individual, but they're probably the key things. Right. Thank you. And do you test for SIBO or no? You don't do the SIBO test? Well, to be honest, I I, I usually assume it based on um, based on symptoms. I think once you've seen it a lot, you can see it, and we, and and to be honest, by the time they've done all the testing for mold, and you know, and they, uh, you know, had to move out of their house and blah blah blah. I have to sometimes just be a little bit more um, thrifty with what we, you know, with what no. finance well, to, to to test. So um, I think if I was, uh, if I didn't need to do a lot of the other testing, maybe I would use it a little bit more. But I, but really, I think a lot of my patients have SIBO. To be honest, oh, and by the time you're going to add the antimicrobials in, maybe some of the antimicrobials they use for mold may also be beneficial for SIBO anyway, right? And C4, yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, 
something that you mentioned at the beginning, which is really important, I think, to uh, stress out is uh, if the person is still living in a contaminated uh, environment, they have to go, they have to go away, right? Absolutely. And that's why I think uh, it's really important to have uh, the patients to see someone that's experienced and also that's really um, can do their whole case and do the, uh, the right testing because you want to be sure um, because you're basically uplifting your whole life. Uh, and sometimes the mold isn't necessarily uh, uh, obvious in the home either, which is another kettle of fish. But yes, so important to be uh, not to be exposed to it. You know, one of the things I kind of, uh, it's the analogy, I guess, is like, um, is trying to treat somebody who's sitting in a house full of asbestos. You know, you have to, you can't just go, oh, yes, we can help you with this and don't worry about the asbestos, pretend it's not there or paint over it. And off you go. It, it, you, you have to, you, you need to stop being continually exposed to it. And uh, something that is really in my mind. So, how much uh, of an exposure to mold? You know, most uh, bathrooms, you know, would have some, you know, moldy areas along the walls or in windows. Or is that, do you think that would be enough to trigger like a SIRS uh, response or, or not? Uh, it's such an interesting question because there, there doesn't seem to be necessarily a, a, a correlation with volume. So I, I I do think, though, that sometimes it can be over a period of time because what happens with people with SERS is that they might have been exposed 10 years ago and because they're not great at detoxifying, it's still, it's still in there and still causing a problem. And then what happens often is that for some weird reason, we tend to be... Um, we tend to move from one homology plate to the other because the smell unconsciously is familiar and homely. And so what sometimes happens, and then people also bring all their contaminated um, contents with them into the next home. And so it may be by home three, they might have had start getting, realizing that they're not really that well and realizing that when they go away on a holiday, whatever, they feel so much better. Um, but then there's other people that are so sensitized, uh, you know, the just the just walking into a room that doesn't even look moldy or anything, and there's maybe someone sitting in that room with moldy clothes on, or it might be the air conditioning. That's the end of them. So, um, so it just depends on what level of sens um, sensitization somebody is at um, as to what is constitutes a lot of mold. It, it is quite different for different people. And sometimes you don't necessarily need to smell the moldy, you know. Uh, you know, typical smell, but it could be that there are mycotoxins flying around or, you know, sticking on walls that you don't even know it, right? Well, I mean, I mean, I, I use myself as an example. So the second time that I realized I was exposed took me six months to realize. And it was because I kept getting, it was at a different type of um, symptoms I was getting in, in the, in the different context. And this was in a clinic that was pristine and white and had a, um, had a, a particular um, machine running that's supposed to be a little bit of an air scrubber, and um, and and I was getting these things like I was getting pins and needles in my hands and stuff, which I hadn't quite got so much before. And anyway, it took me a while to sort of realise. Oh my god, I think it's contaminated. And there was no visible, didn't smell. There was nothing visible. Um, and then it wasn't until I got somebody to come in, and sure enough, exact where I was sitting, of course. Um, was there was some dampness underneath um, that was coming through the concrete so that it was been a rising down the concrete it was hitting the carpet I was on and then in addition to that I had contaminated books that at this stage I didn't realize that books are a problem um, and here we go again so so yeah so it's kind of yeah it, it, does, it does vary between people wow that's a, and uh, that's where we say sometimes you know being like a canary in the mind, right? That's an expression because some people are super sensitive and some others, mm -hmm. some others are not. So, um, mm -hmm. wow, that's really, really interesting. Anything else that you haven't mentioned yet, uh, uh, Lisa, you would like to share with our audience today? Um, look, I think that, um, I think that if anyone is, is thinks that they've got some of those symptoms, I think it's worthwhile going investigating to see if, if mold is the problem because, um, it, it does accumulate and um, and it's really important to get on top of it and actually identify what the problem is and get onto it. Um, really important to see somebody who's experienced in the area um, so it doesn't get mi missed. Um, and for um, those that are um, 
who might be practitioners out there, you know, it is multi-system, multi-symptom. So I think like you were saying, Rosaria, if you're treating SIBO and you're seeing they have SIBO and, and, and all these other things, and it's yeah, and they're and they're not as improving as much as you expected them to. That's where you go. Okay, what else have we got here? Have we got a bold problem? So yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and and if anyone wants any more information about mold, you know, please go to my website, which is lisamcdonald.com.au. Um, there will be probably some announcements coming up soon um, about some things that I've got. Um, I'm going to be um, releasing soon. And so if you get onto the um, the emailing list, uh, you'll get be the first people to know about that. Um, and then the other thing too is is that um, don't forget sometimes um, patients have been to um, lots of practitioners to figure out where the, what's happening with their uh, with their health. And don't forget about the mental health side of things as well. So I think that's all I wanted to add. Thank you, Lisa. So you're are you going to release a course for practitioners soon? Maybe. Maybe. I'm not maybe. You'll have to wait for the announcements. Okay. Well, we hope so. We hope so because it's going to be great. There aren't many courses for practitioners. It's going to be great if you, you know, to be trained by you. Anyway. Yes. Space. Watch this space. Yeah. Watch this space. yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you again, uh, Lisa. It's, going to, it's been awesome to to share all this information on uh, mold toxicity and SIRS. And um, yeah, maybe um, I hope to see you again soon. Fantastic. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed talking about it. Thank you, Lisa.